الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة الحمد لله على منة الولاية وكفى بها منة وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا النبي المؤيد والرسول المسدد والمصطفى الأمجد والمحمود الأحمد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وصحبه المنتجبين ومن سار على دربهم وتمسك بهديهم إلى قيام يوم الدين ثم أما بعد brothers and sisters السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته allow me again to offer my heartfelt condolences to صاحب العصى والزمان عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف marking the uh, the day in which the Imam صلوات الله وسلامه عليه was struck by Abdul Rahman ibn Muljam, which is a sad occasion for all of us and for the Islamic nation at large. We are continuing from where I left from, not yesterday, from the day before, in regard to the question of religion and its importance in the life of a humanity and how the question of religion has unfortunately been misconstrued to many of us that now we have lost touch and base with what religion is supposed to mean and how it can affect and impact on our life. And I said, that from the outset that religion came in the first place not to bewilder man but to guide him to show him the way to launch him into the horizon of knowledge and what we call ma'rifah information and not to uh, re hinder or restrict his movement in life and i always say this and i will continue to say this if religion is not something that can uh, uh, respond to the human need as something that is natural in his life then this is not religion what I'm trying to say in another word if you have to behave in a way that may be looked at as if you are exerting extra effort to show your religiousness then this is not religion because religion is a natural flaw that should come out of the human being in the most basic of ways. I don't have to pretend something I'm not. Right? The Prophet وسلم, his aura was natural. People would come to the Prophet وسلم, and feel the affinity with the Prophet وسلم, because he did not pretend to be something he's not. Yet he was the Prophet of Allah. Yet he was sent by Allah as a guide to mankind. Leadership in Islam is of the same caliber that people need to approach the leadership in Islam. No matter how high that leadership in Islam, without having to feel, you know, that I need to go to extra decorum. And I need to extra, you know, uh, 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 um, doctrines in order to be able to sit with the alim or to sit with the leader or to sit with the president or no, no. It should be one and the same. Like for example, we are told in history that the community of Ahlul Bayt, salam alaykum, the community at the time of the Prophet used to come to the Prophet and approach him normally. People would come and knock at the door of uh, uh, Imam Hussein as if he was an ordinary member of the society. He didn't have security guards, or he didn't have, you know, uh, 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 people to lead him or to lead the visitor into it. He didn't have people to take protocols of appointment. He didn't have to be called a week in advance or an email three weeks before and followed up by a fax three weeks later. None of this existed. A person would show up at the doorsteps of Imam Hussein, knocks on his door, Yabna Rasulullah, I have a problem. Right? Even in the streets, there was no question of putting on extra effort of uh, formalities 
you know, in order to greet or speak or approach an Imam or the Prophet ﷺ. We find in history, for example, a woman would stop the Prophet ﷺ in the streets of Medina and demands that the Prophet listens to her concern. Demands. Huh? And the Prophet ﷺ, we are told in the in the books of history, according to the those people who have written the biography of the Prophet ﷺ, that the Prophet would stop in absolute humbleness. So much so that this riwayah that I'm quoting to you now, where that woman stopped him in the streets of Medina, they quoted the Prophet to have bent his back of respect so much that he was seen as if he's in a state of ruku. Out of respect to a woman in the street, so that she could ask him and open her heart to him. So much so that the Adhan would come and the Prophet is still listening to that woman. So much so that the Adhan is finished and the head of the state, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has to attend to the needs of the Muslims and to the needs of Allah, which is in the medium of prayer, until the Prophet solicits an and, and a permission from the woman and says, Khala, auntie, I need to go and attend to my prayer. Can I ask your indulgence to allow me to go and I promise you I will come back to continue my discussion with you. If a woman comes now and she wants to ask me, for example, a woman, uh, all you know is talking, right? You don't know anything else but how to talk. So much so that, you know, I received two nights a caricature as an email. Two men and one woman representing Adam, Iblis, and a woman standing behind Adam. Adam is speaking to Iblis. He's telling him, I have decided to teach her how to speak. He said, Bana, <laughs> you are creating mischief on us. Hmm? This is our conceptualization of what constitutes a woman, a mouthpiece. But to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he saw fit to stand and listen to a concern of a woman. And it doesn't stop there. It goes beyond that. Because the women of Medina now received the news that the Prophet stopped for an hour listening to concern of that woman. So the women of Medina the next day come and flock the mosque of the Prophet to offer or to open or to vent their concerns to the Prophet wasallam and to share with him what their concerns are. No matter how minute or how small or how grander the problem or the concern may be, but the Prophet was willing to accommodate it. Imam Hussein would walk the streets of Medina. Someone comes to him, he says, Ya ibn Rasulillah, I want you to help me find myself a meal for a day. A meal. What's a meal? Five dollars, six dollars, whatever it is. Imam Hussein pulls out some money, gives it to the man. The man leaves. Imam Hussein calls him back. He says, is there a problem, Ibn Rasulullah? I said, no, no, no. Here is another $11,000 or dinars at the time. He said, I asked for a meal. You're giving me $11,000? He said, yes, I remembered. Because my grandfather, Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had taught that خَيْرُ الْعَطَاءِ مَا أَغْنَى The best of giving is the giving that makes you independent. So that you don't have to roam the streets of Medina. So that I can honor your humanity. Go take the 11,000, invest them. Invest them, make a business. Launch yourself into the horizon of becoming self-sustained. Right? No, no, when we want to give someone, we give him, or we have Parkinson's disease as we are giving him. Ya akhi, give for the sake of Allah. Don't, ya ani. La hawla wa la illa. Give! For the more you give, the more Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give. Give without even anticipating poverty. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. 
says if you were placed on the treasures of Allah you would haul back out of fear of poverty but the hands of Allah are stretched wide open you are the one in need and he is the one who is self-sustained and self-sufficient he doesn't fee giving he gives right and giving brothers and sisters does not entail money no sometimes giving is more grander than money Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam highlights this and this is what we call religion because it's a natural affiliation with the rest of the world that you are living in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says innakum lan tasa'un nasa bi amwalikum by God you will not be able to satisfy people with your wealth because you don't have enough to go around وَلَكِنْ سَعَوْهُمْ بِأَخْلَاقِكُمْ But by Allah you are able to satisfy and sustain people with your ethics and morals. You can please every Tom, Dick and Harry in the street, every Umar, Ja'far and Ali, every whatever with your akhlaq, with your mannerism, with the way you approach people and talk to them right with the way you deal with them with the way you interact with them rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam someone comes to the mosque enters the mosque sits next to the prophet he's a youth doesn't know much about the world doesn't know much about the experiences of adults he comes to the prophet he said ya rasulullah give me permission to commit zina bombshell Everyone in the mosque is fuming and the swords are already out. One guy here says, Ya Rasulullah, da'ni adrubu unuqa. Ya Rasulullah, let me chop his head off. The other guy, let me put him to death. The mentalities of that time that did not know the language of dialogue. They only knew the language of killing. Right? Let me this, let me that. Rasulullah simply diffuses the whole situation. He said, brothers, hello. Hey guys, did he ask you or ask me? Allahu Akbar. Is he soliciting permission from you or from me? No, Ya Rasulullah, sorry. He's talking to you. Okay, come, come closer to me. The young boy comes closer to Rasulullah. He said, come, come, come. Put your knees next to my knees. He's a sinner. He's a sinner. But the Prophet says, no, no, no. I want you to come closer. I want my knees to touch your knees. I want to develop that affinity on the basis of my humanity to your humanity. I tell me something. Now the Prophet is conversing with that young man because he has to go to his level. We, the family of prophets, have been sent by Allah to communicate with people at their level. I can't raise you to my level first. No, I have to come. But I have a turban on my head which is 13, 17 meters long. It doesn't matter. Come down from your pedestal. Come down from your pedestal. It's not going to take your ego away or take your manhood away from you. And if this amama is going to be a hindrance to communicate me and you, I will take it out even. Huh? I will take it out. Let me communicate with you as a brother to a brother. Tell me something. He says, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, would you allow it to your sister? Astaghfirullah. Good. We are getting somewhere, right? Now we are speaking the language of humanity, not the language of swords. Would you allow it to your mother? Come on, Ya Rasulullah. I asked for me. Leave my family alone. Would you like it to your aunt? The Prophet mentions all the mahrams. The young boy saying, no, 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 no. The Prophet says, so do other families. Do not allow it for their family members simple logical the man says ya rasulullah you know something man you are something i have never seen someone speak so eloquently and softly like you the man looks around and everyone is fuming steam is coming out of their ears still because they want to kill him 
So he raises his hand towards heaven. He says, "Allahumma ghfir li wa li Muhammad, wa la taghfir li ahadim ma'ana." He says, "Oh Allah, forgive me and forgive Muhammad. Don't include these dudes, huh? These killers." Rasulullah laughs. The riwayah says until his back is bent. For those who say Rasulullah doesn't laugh. Huh? For those يعني, who want Rasulullah to be that rigid drone, no, Rasulullah wasn't like that. Rasulullah makes it an act of charity to smile towards your brother. He said, does it cost you anything to smile? It doesn't. Then it is an act of charity. It's an act of charity. When we were starting Islam and we were, you know, uh, yani becoming religious and we were told this is religion the first thing I was told you know what it was don't smile it's not part of a faithful character to smile and then I went to the books of hadith the Prophet smiled the Prophet laughed Imam Ali laughed Imam Ali joked huh so where did this 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 character that a mu'min doesn't smile or laugh Imam Ali sits at the table with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam eating kajur, dates, and the the Prophet is eating kajur too. But every time the Prophet eats a kajur, he puts the seed in front of Imam Ali. Right? At the end, the Prophet remarks. He said, "Wow, Ali ibn Abi Talib today is so hungry. Look how much kajur he he ate." Ali ibn Abi Talib said, "Ya Rasulullah, it seems you are more hungry than me because you ate the kajur and the seed." Because there was no seed in front of Rasulullah. They were allowed to joke. But we are not allowed to joke. A Maulana jokes? Man, this will put his value down. It will put his rank down. In which books? And in which religion? And in which faith? And in which standard? It does or makes that. We need to be approachable. We need to be hands-on. Towards, so, Ya Rasul, the Prophet laughs. He said, you know what? Let me change a little bit of your dua. He said, be my guest, Ya Rasulullah. He said, says, oh Allah, forgive me and forgive Muhammad and forgive my brothers and sisters with me. Maybe Allah will soften their hearts with your dua. Don't close what is so huge and abundant, which is the Rahmah of Allah. Don't tighten it. Stretch it, stretch it as much as you want because the Rahmah of Allah is more elastic than you can ever think. More elastic than you ever think. We, our approach towards religion is what, brothers and sisters? Allah doesn't want people to go to hellfire. We want to send them there by the dozens. Well, Allah says, no, 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 no. I did not create hellfire so you can enter it. I, in fact, created hellfire as a deterrent so you will not go towards it. Subhanallah. We want to put them by the bucket full. You know? Yalla, everyone makes this like Jahannam. Fishari Qabr. You know? Uh, Allah will barbecue. You, and you know the funniest thing? The funniest thing that I heard from a mother once, telling her daughter to wear hijab. The daughter could not affiliate with the concept. She's still young. She doesn't want. She said, if you don't put the hijab, Allah is going to swing you from your hair in a fan in Jahannam. I said, there are fans in Jahannam. Whoa, then let's go, man. If there are fans in Jahannam, tomorrow the Koreans will turn them into air conditioning. So what are we worried about? La hawla wa la illa. Is that possible? Is this how we encourage people to come towards Islam and religion? That God is going to swing you from a fan? Doesn't make sense. And that's why I say, brothers and sisters, that religion is not to bewilder man. It's not to hinder him. It's but rather to establish a natural bond between him and his creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not to debase him but rather to elevate his moral nature. It's not there to make him a subject without value. You know, someone who walks the earth without any means of pride in him, positive pride I'm talking about, I'm not talking about negative pride. When someone comes and asks you, what are you? 
Say I am a Muslim, not a Muslim. We are not Muslims. Uh, we are Muslims. Say it with pride. Come out and say. And if someone challenges you, be proud enough to rebut the challenge because you know what you have. You know that religion that you have. Be proud of it. Come out and say it. Don't let people slip away that religion from you which they are fighting you against because they know its value. You know, I read a report on the net and God bless Hajj Google due to the wealth of information that this, you know, network has. That information is at the tip of your finger. Type anything. Wallah, wallah, if that technology was available to a Sheikh al-Suduq or a Sheikh al-Mufid, they would have created wonders in terms of Islamic heritage. But these poor alims of ours, they had to travel east and west just to collect a hadith here or there. While all these hadith are at the tip of your, you know, finger now. The Pentagon produces... 500 papers on Islam a week. 500 paper studies. Look, if this faith is so bad, if this uh, faith is so backward, why produce 500 study papers on such a faith? What's so special about it? That I have to understand it from every avenue and every angle and every perspective in order to appreciate it and know what goes in the mind of a Muslim. But you know what? The studies about Islam that they make, it's about the true Islam of Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Not the Islam that we have made into a mess. Not the Islam that we have turned into a set of rituals that are empty from that connectivity with Allah. I'll show you how. Someone wants to come and do the amals of Laylatul Qadr. What's better than the amals of Laylatul Qadr? Can anyone deny that the amals of Laylatul Qadr are so important? Yet that very person who is so concerned about the amal of Laylatul Qadr does not speak to his brother. What's the worth of your amal? Or does not speak to his cousin? or does not honor his mother, or does not look after his aunt, or does not visit his cousin. You think that you standing on the musalla saying, Ya Allah, and saying, Allah, you want me, reach me by reaching your cousin and your mother and your brother. That's how you reach me. That's how you come to me. Because it is Allah who said that. When he created the womb, he called it Rahim. He called it, Rahim in Arabic, which is derived from what? Kinship. Kinship. From mercy. Right? What did Allah say to that Rahim, to that womb? He said, you are the Rahim, the diminutive form of mercy, or I am the Rahman, the grander form of mercy. Whoever connects you, connects me. Or whoever severs you, severs his relationship with me. Don't come to me on the night of Qadr saying, Amman yujibul muttar. Don't, don't. Go reconcile your problems first. Today, go home and see if you have an issue with anyone. Pick up the phone. Lower your pride a little bit. Here, lowering pride is good. Huh? Humbling oneself even if you are wrong. Even if the other party is wrong. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. What makes you a human being is when you begin to become a human being. No one is born a human being. Yes, you are born in the species of a human being. But in order to become a true human being, the moment of your humanity begins from the moment of your giving and sharing. Not from the moment of your birth. The worth of a human being is from the moment that he gives, not from the moment he is born. For example, those who celebrate their birthdays. I don't have any problem with people celebrating birthdays, by the way. But those who celebrate their birth, someone celebrating his birthday at the age of 70. You know, I stand there and ask this guy, not him, he has to ask himself, what have I offered humanity in 70 years? 35 years on social benefit. 
right? The other 25 years that I started, I never even went to college. I was just clubbing and what have you. Huh? The, th the last 10 years of my life, I was just abusing my wife and children. Yet I'm celebrating the golden jubilee of my existence. Hello! What are you celebrating? Huh? What are you celebrating? Celebrate your worth. When you are able to give and share, this is what you celebrate. Sheikh al Alam al Majlisi or al Alam al al Saduq, one of them, I'm not sure. When he became Baler, he celebrated his first birthday. Subhanallah. He was asked, Are you celebrating your birthday? How can wow, Maulana? <laughs> you are a Maulana, you are Shaykh al Taifa, you are the, the Shaykh of the Madhab. He said, Yes, I will because I'm so jubilant at this moment. He said, Why? He said, Because before I became Baleg, I was a non entity. Now God recognizes me as an entity. Allahu Akbar. Now I can relate to the cause of my existence. Of course I'm going to celebrate my birthday. Because today is the day I am born. Because now I can live. Now I am a person who has an entity and can be recognized. So we say that religion does not come to debase you. On the contrary, it comes to elevate you and elevate your moral worth. It is not to deprive you of anything useful or to burden you or to oppress your qualities but to open for you an exhaust inexhaustible treasures of correct thinking and sound action islam does not take anything from you brothers religion does not come to curb you no if it takes something from you it gives you a thousand other avenues right but you know what it gives you this is the amazing thing about Islam, is that it takes what is unuseful and it gives you what is useful. The head of the French army in Syria, when Syria was under occupation by the French, invited a group of alims for iftar during Ramadan. So when he came in, in order to tease him, in order to squeeze his morality and his respect, he ordered that alcohol will be served on the table. Ramadan, with people wearing turbans, and you're ordering alcohol on the table. So he came, his wife, his daughter, that uh, the, 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 the head of the army was sitting down. He turned to the sheikh, he said, Sheikh Huna, why is it? that you don't drink alcohol when alcohol is made from grapes. So what is made from grapes, if it turns into juice, there is no difference, one and the same. And he cracked the biggest laugh. The sheikh looks at him and he says, you know what? Your wife is sitting here and your daughter is sitting here. Your daughter is made from your wife. You can go to your wife. Would you go to your daughter? They're one and the same. They made from one another. Why is it that this you can go to and this you can't go to? Because this is useful and this is unuseful. That's Islam. That's religion. It comes to make things useful to you so you can use it. And abandon what is not useful. It does not take something from you simply because God wants to make things difficult. Because God does not contradict himself. He is the one who said in the Quran, Ma ja'ala alaykum fi min harak. God does not wish to make religion difficult on you. Right? No. It is easy. Simple. Sayyid Muhsin al-Hakim, when he wants to perform his hajj, he's never been to hajj. When he wrote his Risala Amaliya, you know, the book of edicts, it was so to the point and so strict that when he went to perform Hajj, he couldn't, according to his taqlid. Subhanallah. He couldn't do it. He had to do rujur to his son, who was a mushtahid. He's a grand marja of his time. Why? Because now he's with reality. <laughs> he's face to face with reality. He knows that Allah does not wish to make things difficult to you. He didn't say, but this is my opinion. He couldn't perform it. Allah says, does not want to make things difficult for you. It is not to confine you. 
brothers and sisters, to narrow limits of fanaticism, either my opinion or my way or Faisal Road or the highway. No! Man, sit in dialogue. Sit and let's talk, even if I disagree with you on a point. Sit and let's talk. Maybe I can learn from you and you can learn from me. Maybe we can share ideas together. Even if you were more learned than me, because the Prophet said, Perchance there is someone who's holding a piece of information towards someone who is more learned than him, but that more learned than him does not have this particular point of information that is missing. So he will utilize it. He will benefit from it. Imam Ali Salamullah Ali in another narration says what? He says, Man shawara nas sharakahum fi uqulihim. Whosoever consult people will add part of their intelligence to his intelligence. Allah. He adds part of their brains, part of their mind to their mind. Why? Because he's probing into their way of thinking. Don't narrow yourself to limits of fanaticism. This is my way. You don't follow my way. See you in your, uh, you know, aunt's house. The Arabs, when they say aunt's house, mean they're sending you to jail. Okay? Either my way or your aunt's house. You're going to jail. You're going to hellfire. No. No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know what? So amazing the approach of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of leaving room for dialogue that he had a dialogue with Iblis. Does Allah need to have a dialogue with Iblis, brothers and sisters? Ma, he knows him. He comes to him and he says, why didn't you prostrate before Adam? Why would Allah ask him? He wants, to, he wants Iblis to present his point, right? He says, You created me from fire and you created him from clay. Well, your excuse is lame. It doesn't make sense. Huh? Reconsider your position. He said, no, I am better than him. Allah says, the question is not about who is better. The question is about who will submit. That's the question. I have no problem between you and him. I have no problem between you or Adam. The problem is who is going to submit. And when I issue an order, I want people to comply. When I say something, put a full stop. Don't put a question mark. Right? Put a full stop. Don't put a question mark. Iblis put a question mark. But Allah did not condemn him straight away. He asked him. He dialogued with him. And Allah says, if I was willing and I'm the creator and the sovereign owner of this world, I was able to dialogue with Iblis, what stops you or human from dialoguing with one another? Why? Why limit yourself to your own ideas, to your own limitations? Wallah, our Imams were so open to everyone. And I quoted in day one, what happened with Imam Jafar Sadiq and Abu Hanifa? When Abu Hanifa came and said to Imam as Sadiq, what do you think about this issue? He said, well, Abu Hanifa, you in Iraq say this, and the people of Hijaz say this, and the people of Basra say this, and the people of Egypt say this, and we Ahlul Bayt say this. Take it or leave it, it's up to you. La ilaha illallah. You know what Abu Hanifa then says? He says, by God, this has always been my opinion. Abu Hanifa, the Imam is speaking to the Imam. He's saying, you know what? I've always held the view that the most learned among people are those who know about their differences. Not the one that says, this is my way. But what do you know about my way? I don't know. But you're wrong. Hello, man. <laughs> and you didn't even ask me. You don't even know what my opinion, but you're wrong. But listen to me, you're wrong. You know, like we migrate to the West. We live for 30 years. We make wealth. We, 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 we experience what it means to be a human. And then when someone asks us, what do you think about the West? Shaitan. Ajeeb. And our countries are Rahman. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. The one that does not respect you, the one that does not honor you, the one that does not even give you status, does not. And you know what Imam Ali says? I'm not a pro-Western person. I'm not advocating West. I'm advocating truth. Wherever the truth comes, I am more worthy of it than anyone else, and you are, right? Imam Ali, when he was asked about which is your country, what constitutes your country, in order to kill this patronism among his followers, that I am from Bani Tamim, or I am from Bani Aranawat, or I am a Hashemite, 
well, I'm a Quraishite, well, I am whatever. He says, no, 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 no. The best of countries is the country that offers you service and honors you as a human being. خير الأوطان ما حمله. The best of countries that provide for you. Imam Zain al Abidin said, it is not part of fanaticism to love your countrymen. No, 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 it's okay. I'm living in London. All of a sudden, I know the new arrival of Pakistani family. Oh, I feel good. Because they're from my country. Fine. Imam Zain al Abidin, no problem. He says, but fanaticism is when you prefer your countrymen over someone else though your countrymen are bad and the other is good that's fanaticism that is being fanatic and being patriotic in the wrong way as you know the Arabs say me and my brother against my cousin and me and my cousin against the enemy if I don't have a brother but there is no question in the whole formula whether who is right or wrong doesn't matter me and my brother against my cousin, even my cousin is right. I'll kill him. Ajeeb. Amazing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala draws to us an analogy of truth in the Quran when we even deal with those who hate us, with those who don't like us. He says, وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا اِعْدِلُوا هُوَ أَقْرَبُ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ he says, do not allow the animosity of people against you to make you unjust. No. Don't allow the animosity and the hatred of others towards you make you unjust. No. You should be just for it is more righteous in the eyes of Allah. Even if someone doesn't like you. The principle and the maxim of justice should not be determined on the basis of whom I'm dealing with. It should be determined on the principle that I believe in. I am a just person. I don't compromise in order to weaken my principle of justice when it suits me and when it doesn't suit me. No. I don't twist religion. Like when it comes to divorce. You know, and this is something we are having so much problem with it. What does God say about divorce? He says, do not leave your women hanging in the Quran. Don't leave her hanging. She doesn't know whether she's married or divorced. Why? Because there is a dispute. And then the man says, what to his wife? Wallah, I'm going to leave you hanging until you die. It's like he is rebutting God himself. God says, don't leave her hanging. He says, well, I will leave you hanging. Why? Because he wants to twist religion. Why he wants to twist religion? Because he doesn't want to pay the mahar. Because if he divorces her, he has to pay the haq, right? So he will coerce her, coerce her, tighten her, kill her, until she says, listen man, I don't want your haq, just divorce me. Ah, okay, now, talaq. This is unjust. This is unjust. And Allah says, do not use religion and twist it when it suits you and when it doesn't. Amir al muminin gives us an amazing bill of rights and bill of justice. Salawatullahi wa salamu I will continue my talk on the question of religion over the next, inshallah, seven days because we have to do some masai. Amir al muminin was visited by his brother Aqil. One day, Aqil had fallen under debt. He says, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, I'm your brother. I have fallen under debt due to some bad investment, and I have fallen in debt to the value of about 120,000 dinars. Amir al Mu'mineen says, You know what? I get paid a year 12,000. Do you want them? Take. I don't get paid more than 12,000. Take them or leave them. He says, Ya Amir Mu'mineen, I'm telling you, I'm under $120,000 or whatever worth of debt. You're giving me $12,000, what are they going to do? He says, so what do you want me to do? He says, the treasury is under your command. Ah, subhanAllah. The treasury of the Muslims is under your command. One order from you. 
one order to the people in the treasury, one small letter, you know, pay Aqeel ibn Abdul Muttalib or ibn Abu Talib $120,000 because he's the brother of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Who's going to question you? No one. Amir al-Mu'mineen, it was a cold night. There was some charcoal in front of him, you know, fire. He grabs a piece of wood. He says to Aqil, open your hand. <laughs> open your hand. He says, yeah, Amir al-Mu'mineen, you want to burn your brother? He said, you didn't think about burning your brother in the hereafter? He said, you didn't think about the consequences of Amir al-Mu'mineen sanctioning a check, a check behind Muslims, you know, Muslims back so that he will satisfy your debt. This is something that Amir al-Mu'mineen will not tolerate or do. Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamullah alayhi, even with his killer, Abdul Rahman ibn Mulja, was a fair and honest human being. He would not see it fit in himself that Amir al Mu'mineen would be lying on the lap of Al Hassan hmm? while his blood is coming out of his head, who is suffering the very ailment and the Poison that he was struck with on his head by his very own killer Abdul Rahman ibn Muljam. When he saw that Abdul Rahman ibn Muljam was brought in front of Ali ibn Abi Talib عليه, with his hand tied behind his back, Amir al Mu'mineen realized that the cuffs were tightened on his hand that they were so tight it began to create scratches on his wrist. Amir al-Mu'mineen said to Imam Hassan, set me upright. Let me sit right, despite untighten your slave. Untighten him. And in as much as you have offered me food, offer him of the same food. This is Ali ibn Abi said, offer him that milk that you are offering me. The same milk that was oozing out of the strike that Ali ibn Abi Talib sustained, salamullah alayhi, he offered the same glass of milk to his killer. And he said to him, O oh, Ibn Muljam, was Ali ibn Abi Talib a bad ruler to you? Allahu Akbar. Ma a'zamaka ya Ali. How great are you, O oh Ali, that you are conversing with your killer? And you are saying to him, Was I a bad ruler to you that I deserve to be struck by you? At that moment, Ibn Muljam cries. And he says, By Allah, O oh Amir al-Mu'mineen, you are the fairest of the fairest. You have to admit to the truth. You have. At that moment, Amir al-Mu'mineen, turns to his two sons and speak to them salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi and he says what to them he says oh Hassan and Hussein remain steadfast in piety resign yourself to the will of God never aspire to anything which is beyond your reach always be truthful and merciful towards the orphans Help the poor and the needy and try to live in the world in a way which may help it become better. Stop the tyrant from his oppression. Assist the afflicted and act upon the commandments of Allah. And do not put off by any obstacles. Don't be deterred by the obstacles that you will face here and there. No, no, not at all. And then Imam Hussein, Imam Ali turns to Imam Hussein because Imam Ali knows what's going to happen to Imam Hussein. Salawatullah wa salamu alayh. He says, Oh Hussein, I, as if I can see the strike of your neck, it is as if I am present. On the day when the killers will come and they will cut your throat or son. It is as if I am there. 
And Imam Hassan, you know what he says to Abi Abdullah al Hussein when he was passing away after he drank, you know, that poison that his wife gave him, Ju'da or Jad'a, her name. He says, Oh, oh Hussein, la yawm ka yawm ka ya Aba Abdullah. There is no day like your day, O oh Abu Abdullah, when you face the killers face to face. Even when you face your killers face to face, you will be crying for them, O oh, Hussein. When Zainab comes out of her tent and she says, she sees Imam Hussein crying, she says, Abu Abdullah, why are you crying? You've already left, you've already lost your brothers, your children, your companions. No one, no one made you cry when you see, saw them now dying in front of you what makes you cry at this moment of time and down one, no one is left except the woman of the household of the prophet he said oh zainab i am so concerned about these people entering hellfire on my account i don't want to be the cause of these people entering hellfire on my account that is not my duty in life and then Amirul Mu'mineen Salawatullahi Salaam Alayhi said, This is a child I am entrusting to your care. He will represent me on the day of your supreme sacrifice and will lay down his life in defending you. Now Imam Ali is speaking to Abu Fadl. He's saying to Imam Hussain, I entrust this child in your hand because he will be my representative on that day. Then Imam Ali turns to Abu Fadl. He says what? Oh Abbas, my child, I know your unbounded love for Hussein. When that day comes, consider no sacrifice to great for Hussein and his children. Imam Ali breathes his last, saying to his children, I make you my representative be conscious of Allah and make sure you organize your affair Imam Ali's soul departs when Hussein fell down on the plains of Karbala Zainab rushed to him when he was breathing his last Umar ibn Sa'ad Look towards Imam Hussein, Zainab looked him in the eye. She said, O oh, Umar ibn Sa'd, Ayuqtal ibn binti Rasulillah, wa anta tanzuru ilayya. She said, O oh, Umar ibn Sa'd, will the grandson of Rasulullah be killed while you are watching him? Umar ibn Sa'd shed his tears for Imam Hussein. Look what he says, instead of putting stop to evil, he says to his henchmen, isn't there anyone among you who will go down and relieve him of his suffering and kill him? Ten men go down to Abi Abdullah, salam Allah. Ten men, among them the shimmer, who goes down to Imam Hussein. But you know, when you look at this, okay, they killed Imam Hussein, salam Allah. I will conclude. I want to ask a question. The question to any sane person in the world, why then after you kill the grandson of Rasulullah, you order 10 men to walk on the body of Imam Hussein with the hooves of your horses? Why? What justifies that 10 horsemen will run up and down the body of Imam Hussein salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّ مُنْقَلَبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ Brothers and sisters, let us turn to Allah with sincere hearts, calling on Him for those who have asked us to pray for them on this night and every night, for those who are suffering from problems, for those who are sick, for those who are going through difficulties, for the emancipation, and forgiveness of our sin, let us turn to Allah and cry out, Amman, يُجِيبُ الْمُطَّرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ Together, brothers and sisters, Amman, يُجِيبُ الْمُطَّرَّ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ 
أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء بحط محمد وآل محمد وبحرمة الفاتحة مع الصلوات اللهم صل وعليكم السلام Absolutely, I agree. And I think uh, one of the easiest approaches to this is to understand the severity and the consequences of being judgmental of others. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet, he says in Surah Al-Hujurat, for example, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la yaghtab ba'dukum ba'dan, wa la tajassasu, wa la yaghtab ba'dukum ba'dan, ayuhibbu. أَحَدُكُمْ أَنْ يَأْكُلَ لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِهْتُمُوهُ The Prophet ﷺ says that you should not put yourself in a position and implicate yourself in a position where you suspect and you uh, 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 uninformedly blame, gossip, slander your brothers in faith or your brothers that you relate to per chance that if you do you are actually making an accusation because it's not it's not a fact and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says would any of you allow himself to eat the flesh of his brother alive would you be in a position to cut a piece of your own brother's flesh and eat it surely it is detestable so I think the onus is on educating ourselves primarily that do I need to be in that position? When Imam Ali, for example, says, yesterday I mentioned that hadith, solicit 70 different excuses on behalf of your brother before you begin accusing him. Now we accuse him 70 times before we solicit one excuse for him. Right? Which is a double standard. What we need to do is that, I think often we face the dilemma that this is the status quo. This is what everyone does. What is going to make me so different to everyone else? That is, in fact, what is going to make you different. That you must challenge the status quo. You must take initiative and be, be the sacrifice, even if it had to come to that far. The sacrifice of correcting people's perception and understanding about what they perceive something normal. Yani, for example, the Prophet and that's how people perceive things normal, brother. The Prophet ﷺ goes to a, uh, a cemetery and he says, the owners of these two graves are being tormented and they are being tormented for something that is not major. But not major in what? In people's perception. Huh? So they said, for what reason are, are they being tormented, Ya Rasulullah? He said, one of them was used to always backbite people and slander them. To us, slandering and backbiting is not a big deal. We are chilling, brother. Or we are chillaxing. 
right? Chillaxing, yani we are chilling and relaxing. You put them together, it becomes chillaxing. So we are chillaxing. What's the big deal if we said something about this brother here and there? It's the norm. In fact, if you go to a, a gathering and you don't gossip, you find that this gathering is dry. Man, it doesn't have any taste to it. We have to, you know, eat at each other's blood and flesh. No. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once in the month of Ramadan in regard to this issue he called two ladies to come to his house and he sent Bilal to call them initially he was told Bilal go take these two buckets give each woman a bucket and tell them to throw up and open their fast tell them open the fast your rosa is not accepted so they went the, ma the, 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 the man went Ima uh, Bilal uh, ta'ala he went to this woman. He said, Rasulullah says, uh, open your fast, your rosa is batal. So, billah. How can we open our fast? This is before Allah, we are fasting. So Bilal goes to the Prophet, the Prophet summons them, he says, come, come, come. Alright, you don't want to open your rosa? Okay. Then I will ask you now, excuse my language, I want you to throw up in this bucket, you now, throw up. The riwayah says, they did, they threw up blood with fleshes of meat in the bucket. It's a true rewire. They were shocked. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, see why I told you to open your rosa? They said, yes, yes, ya Rasulullah, now we understand. Because we couldn't leave one woman in Medina, we didn't speak about her. She's this and she's that, her hair is ugly, her, uh, I don't know, eyebrow are not sitting well, I don't know which hairdresser she goes to, oh, what's it to you? What hairdresser she goes to, or what, uh, you know, leave people alone. Huh? But change has to come from within, brother. Yani, if I see the community doesn't affiliate with that, let me at least affiliate. How? If I see that judgment is being passed on someone unfairly, I should withdraw from the whole gathering. As a form of protest to what is being happening, people will not repeat it. How does sin spread in the world, brother? By consent approval of the rest of the community. Someone comes, introduces something that is not right, people turn a blind eye. He will do it again. He will do it the third time. The fourth time, it becomes the norm. It becomes the norm and how that, how, that is how it, it grows. Here there is a very interesting question. Have I satisfied my... The, so, oh, mashallah. Here there is a very interesting question that talks about commemorating the 40th of our loved ones. But the way that the question has come, it says that we have been told, and I don't know where this is coming from, this is the first time I've heard it or the second time I've heard it, is that when we are commemorating the 40th of our dead ones, we should not make it on the 40th out of respect to the Imam. So we should make it 38, 39, we celebrate once, and then after the 40th passes, we celebrate and commemorate, sorry, another 40th, out of respect to the Imam, because only the Imam should be observed or should be honored with the 40th day of practice of commemorating the Imam. Where do we have a reference to this in Sharia? Beats me if I know. Beat me if I know. I don't know. No Sharia law, no madhab, no school of thought, no nothing says that you should do have 240. You know, the logic says if you are having 240, one before, one after, that means this guy is more honored than the Imam himself. Right? In order to skip the 40th, now you are doing you are doing two instead of one? Yeah, uh, that even the concept of 40th, where did it come from? It came from the fact that Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari decided when he heard that Imam Hussein had been martyred in Karbala, he decided to come and visit, and he was among the first people to visit Imam Hussein, and it happened to be on the 40th where he met with the caravan of Ahlul Bayt or uh, upon their return from Sham at that moment according to history and they met there and they you know uh, uh, spoke to one another and, and that where the commemoration of the 40th come from but there is nothing in Sharia to say uh, even if I don't commemorate the 40th of my loved one am I doing something against Sharia there is no question there is no question you know you want to commemorate commemorate but don't make it a ritualistic commemoration as if if I don't do it, I'm no longer a follower of the school of, of thought, or I am not a person to be reckoned with as a, a follower of Ahl al Bayt. Okay. So, I have a question.
someone in the order? Oh, yes, yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Yes. I don't want to talk about the details, but I will talk about the. Sorry, uh, I will talk about. Okay, all right. Sorry. I've been told to make my uh, answers brief. Something I don't know how to do. Please bear. With me. Sorry, <laughs> but I, I, I will do my level best. The Imam was specifically told by the Prophet that in order to keep intact the unity of Muslims, when it comes to the question of your Imam, right? This I'm talking about from my perspective. Yani when I say my perspective, I'm talking about the perspective of the school of Ahlul Bayt. With all due respect to other schools of thought. When I speak from that perspective, I'm speaking as to what I believe the Prophet told the Imam And then this can be verified from books of history, biographies, whatever the case may be. If your Imam is going to cause a rift among the Muslims, after my demise, and Islam is still fresh and new in the minds of people, you must advocate unity and not advocate disunity among the Muslims. And that's why the Imam himself said, La usaliman, aw la usaliman, meaning what? I shall surrender what is mine in lieu of keeping the unity of Muslims intact. This is the statement of Imam Ali, not my statement, right? Now, having said that, in order to keep the unity among the Muslims, and I know that I am more worthy of that post of Imamah than others. From my own perspective, from what the Prophet has told me, right? Should I then isolate myself if I want to keep that unity or be part and parcel of that setup until I am in a position to correct it and rectify it? And that is the position that Amir al-Mu'mineen took. He did not consent to the government being just or not or right or whatever the case may be. We're not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that Amir al-Mu'mineen saw himself in a position that if I feel that the situation is unjust, the situation is not right, I must still participate in the system at hand until I am in a position to correct it and veer it back to the right course. And that is what the Imam was trying to teach us throughout the course of history that we should never go underground. We should not form our ghettos. We should not shun ourselves from the rest of the community. We should be part and parcel, expose ourselves, expose our thinking, participate in the system at hand that we live under so that we can gain momentum and understanding and respect in the communities we live in for the sake of keeping that unity intact. Right? And if we do that, then surely we would promote the madhab of Ahlul Bayt in a better dimension. And if anyone wants to question this argument of the Imams, then they should question the very argument that Imam Musa Rida Salamullah accepted in the government of Ma'moon. Right? Why did Imam Rida accept the government of Ma'moon? Was a Ma'moon what Amir al Mu'mineen? He was not Amir al Mu'mineen. Ma'moon was as tyrant as any of the tyrants of Bani Umayyah and Bani Abbas, right? Yet, um, uh, 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 Imam Musa Rida wanted to show us that even when you have a so-called tyrant government, right? If you are unable to remove it, join it to correct it so that you can have a say in what is going wrong. This is Amr bil-Ma'roof al-Munkar. 
Amr bil Ma'roof is not sitting at home waiting for the Imam Ajal Allah Ta'ala Farajah Sharif to come and change the whole world for us and make it easy for us. You know, the Imam is coming, I'll chill at home. You'll chill at home and the Imam has to do the house, the, the, the hard work for you? No. These are examples, giving examples so that we can move forward in the life setup that we find ourselves in. Next. Okay. Uh, any questions from the audience before I go to the list of questions? Okay. Salam. Uh, I do understand that men have the option of variety of their wife for their satisfaction, but men want women to accept them as they are, but they don't accept women as they are. Men always joke about how women, especially mm, marriage uh, or married one, I think, uh, live their life. Can't men accept family life as a matter of joy and be in a state of acceptance? Rather be wishful of bachelorhood forever, please throw some light. Wallah, this is the best lecture I've ever heard in my life. What throw light I'm gonna... <laughs> this is the best lecture I, I will invite the sister to continue. <laughs> uh, uh, deliberate on that. I, I have no comment, honest to God. I'm, I'm mesmerized by such eloquence. Uh, but I will add one thing to this. Uh, the one thing I will add to this is the following. Why can't marriage life be as joyful as bachelor life, if not better? Right? And I said two days ago, I don't know if I said it here or... I said, when God regulates your life by the medium of marriage as opposed to the medium of fornication. When he says fornication is haram and marriage is halal, that means Allah is regulating, not restricting. So. If I want to explore my fantasies, then let me explore my fantasies in marriage. Right? And not even when it is marriage, say, oh, I'm not used to this. Then you are pushing me to bachelor life. Right? Women and men must understand that what they need to make inside the home should be at the apex of sexual satisfaction within the parameters of religion. And this is your right. Allah says, Nisa'ukum harthun lakum fa'tu harthakum anna shi'tum. Of course, your men are the same. Don't explore your fantasies outside. Explore it inside. It's only befitting to do something like that. What does it mean when people say that heaven lies under the mother's feet? In what context does this fall under? In the context that the mother first should be an ideal mother towards her children. In the context that a mother should part her love to her children to appreciate and understand that Jannah do really lies under her foot. Because you know what the Prophet says Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in one of his ahadith and this hadith should send shivers down each and every one of our spines. He says, أَبَ... For those who understand Arabic, may Allah's mercy be withdrawn from parents. I don't want to use the word curse. Because the word cursing in Arabic means, according to the Quran, withdrawing Allah's mercy. You know why I don't want to use the word curse? Because the word cursing, la'an, in our terminology does not mean that. It means a swearing word. But if you know, we use la'an in that context that Allah uses, no problem. But in our community, that is not the meaning of la'an. La'an means I'm, I'm swearing at your dad. That's what I'm swearing. You know? So Allah here, he says, may, the Prophet says, may Allah withdraw his mercy from a set of parents who are the cause of their children rebelling against them. Don't be as a parent the cause of your children rebelling against you. No. Be there as your parents so your children can appreciate you as a parent. And then they will understand the meaning of what it means to, but wallah, the parents to take the liberty, for example, of always using that, you know, rocket launchers. Wallah, I will not be pleased with you. Bombshell. Mom, I want to, I'm not pleased with you. Dad, I'm not pleased with you. 
If you don't change the couch from red to orange, I'm not pleased with you. Uh, uh, Habibi, my wife likes orange. Why is it that I have to change it to your liking? You don't live with me at home, Dad, with all due respect to you. This is not challenging the authority of the dad. But the dad should not put himself in that position. Huh? The Prophet says, don't put yourself in that position so that your son will rebel against you. You know, son, I don't like the shades of your lounge room. They don't make sense. I've never heard of blue going with brown. They're odd colors. But dad, I love brown and blue. We'll change it. Or... No inheritance. La hawla wa la Over a shade and a, and a color of, of, of... Don't be in that position. Now, when parents ask you, look, the Prophet... Sorry, where is Brother Ali? I have to... These questions, uh, they're not allowing me, Brother Ali. <laughs> I have to go into a lecture. I, all right. With your permission. Oh, and the permission of the audience, please. This is a learning experience for all of us. Uh... uh the Prophet وسلم, a man comes to the Prophet with a young child, 14 years old, complaining to the Prophet about the recalcitrant attitude of his son. Yani, you understand the word Uku? Uku. He's, he's a rebel. He said, he doesn't listen to me, he doesn't honor me, he does not, uh, the, the list goes down. The Prophet is about to speak. Then he wants to find out the young child jumps in. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I hate to cut you off. But I want to ask you something. My father is asking for his rights from me. Do I have a right on him? Very logical. Rasulullah says, Bala, of course, my son. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I plead to you to tell me what are my rights. He said, first and foremost, your dad should marry a good mother for you. Yani the right of the child begins before his birth, not after. Yani the Prophet says, marry someone good, marry someone religious, marry someone that will help you through life, marry someone that affiliate with your ambitions and you affiliate with her ambition, marry someone that is natural, not plastic, marry someone that, yani, who is not blonde and brunette for the sake of her eyebrows and whatever. No, 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 marry for the right reason. The son says, yeah, oh, oh, okay. What's next, Ya Rasulullah, anything else? He said, yes, and he should give you a good name. Yani he should honor you. He should honor you. When he gives you a name, he's honoring you. He said, ha, ha. Next, Ya Rasulullah, he said, he should teach you. The son is nodding. The Prophet says, what's your problem? He said, firstly, my father married a very bad woman. No respect. You know, no sense of motherhood. Nothing. Secondly, he said he called me a beetle. Would anyone call his son a beet, an insect? Jo'lan, he called his son. Imagine someone calling himself a beetle. Not those beetles of Great Britain. Beetle, that insect that walks, you know, the beetle. He said, La ilaha illallah. And then he says, and the third one, he said, not once he sat with me and taught me a word. What did the Prophet say? He said to that man, he said, you became very consultant towards your son before he became very consultant against you. We need to reciprocate rights and obligation, brothers and sisters. Having said that, of course, the position of mother is very high in the eyes of Allah. And that's why the Prophet says, literally, literally, if this riwayah is authentic and correct, Jannah lies at the feet of mother. Yani if basically you go to your mother and you say, Mom, tonight, girls, boys, go to your mom and say, left your feet, left, left. And please just put them in my lap. Why? Because I literally want to sit in Jannah. I literally want to sit in Jannah. And that's what the meaning of the hadith is. Is Satan a jinn? Yes. He cannot be an angel because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّ إِبْلِيسَ كَانَ مِنَ الْجِنِّ فَفَسَقَ عَنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّهِ Meaning, Iblis was from the family of jinn and he turned against Allah's order. He is not an angel. Yes, he used to worship in the company of angels, but he is not an angel. Can you eat food made by Hindus? Oh, oh Paris is...
Is it haram to fast when on holiday during Ramadan? Is it haram to fast when on holidays during Ramadan? What is that supposed to mean? I don't understand. Of <laughs> yani if you are on holiday, it's better to fast. It's twice the merit that you should fast. But if you are on holiday, it doesn't mean you have a holiday from fasting as well. You have holiday from school, but not holiday from fasting. Question of eating food from Hindus or Parises. I don't want to go into the debate or dwell in it too much. It's, it depends on your marja of taqlid. What he says about the tahara or non-tahara of these uh, people. How can life be called a gift when it is full of worries? Full of worries from our perspective. We make life miserable. Life is beautiful. In Safin, a man was condemning life. Life is this, life is that. Life is condemned. Life that Imam Ali came. Oh, hold on, hold on. Why are you cursing life when Allah made life the cultivating land of his rightful servant? It is what you make of it. You want to make it miserable? You make it miserable. You want to pick a fight every day with your neighbor? That's your problem. You want to pick up a fight with your wife? It's your problem. If the wife wants to pick up a fight with her husband, it's her problem. But if you sit and discuss and dialogue and come to a common terms together, yes, life has challenges, but not worries. Because if you look at a challenge from a positive point of view, that challenge will help you become a better human being. Because without challenges, you cannot grow and develop. I said the question of water. Leave that water unchallenged here at this podium for two months. You come back, can you drink it? No, but tip it every day and tip it back into the glass and keep doing this for the course of two months. Can you drink it after two months or not? Yes, you can, because it's being challenged. The position of the water is being changed, tipped, played with. It is not the same water, it's constantly moving. And you as a human being, God wants you to constantly move. And the only way God will make you move if he challenges you. But you determine the severity of the challenge. God gives you the challenge. How do you deal with the challenge is what makes life miserable or good. Right? Tell me something. If in our standard life was miserable, when Imam Ali was struck on his head, what should have he cried out? He should have cried, whoa, what a miserable life this is. That after all these sacrifices, I also get struck on the head. Right? Instead, what did he say? He said, by Allah, the world of the universe, the glory of the universe, I have become triumph and jubilant. Fusto wa rabbul ka'ba. First, first, that challenge gave me an entry into heaven, positiveness. Huh? Look at things from a positive nature. I think there is more. If we deliberately commit a big sin, knowing it was wrong and did it many times, how can we ask God for forgiveness if it took God years to forgive Adam? What hope is this for us? Now I want to meet, I want to really go into Latmiya. This is what God wants you for. God wants you to sin. Really? Go, uh, let's all sin then tonight, brothers. No, 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 I didn't mean that. I mean that if you happen to sin and you repeat your sin, look what Allah says. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِينَ Say, O oh my servant who extravagantly sinned against themselves. Extravagantly, yani more than once. Extravagant, yani you are continuously, you know, in, uh, indulging in what? In, uh, in sinning. Do not despair of Allah's mercy. The ayah doesn't end. There's a continuation. Because God forgive 30% of your sins. No. 50? No. Of 75? No. Of 99.99? God is still not satisfied. Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jamiha. God forgive all sins. Not 99.99 like our elections. No, no. <laughs> you know, everyone that comes to the elections always wins by 99.99. Subhanallah. Huh? Anyone that comes. Anyway, Allah says, no, no. 100%. Then what? Then listen to this. 
Aman, this is Riwaya in uh, either Wasail al-Shia or one of the other book and this riwayah is also has been authenticated and mentioned in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim and the books of our Sunni brothers and it is also in our books. A man kills 99 people, comes to someone who's religious. He says, I've killed 99 people, I've decided to repent. <laughs> Bana, what are you talking about? Get out of here, man. And uh, you are the fuel for hellfire. He said, is that the case? He killed you. If that is the case, he killed you. 100. The man quest and thirst for tawbah and repentance is in his heart. He wants to repent. He went to a scholar. He said, look, I've killed 100 people and I want to repent. He said, and what stops you from turning to Allah and asking for his repentance? He said, really? After 100 people? He said, yes. But you have to do one thing. He said, what? He said, the city you are staying in, it's an evil city. Leave it. Change the environment. Change the company of friends. You know, sometimes we want Hidayah, but we still want to hang out with the same group. Huh? We still want to go, you know, barbecue tonight. I don't know what tonight. We still want to hang with the same people and chill with the same people. Yeah, you want to change? Change the setup. Of course, there's nothing wrong with barbecue tonight. I don't know the place. I'm just... <laughs> don't think I have an issue with it. Astaghfirullah, please. I don't want to break the man's income. <laughs> Go. Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So what happens? He goes. He said, change the environment. He said, okay. But Allah will accept. He said, Allah will accept your tawbah. And this hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The man moved with the intention that see, he wants to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he wants to repent. On the way, he died. On the way, he died. Allah sent angels to take him, but he sent two groups. One group to take him towards Adab because he killed 100 people, and the others to take him to Jannah. They had a dispute. Who will take him? Allah sent Jibra'il to arbitrate between them. He said, I have a way. What is the way? He said, measure the period, uh, the distance. If he's closer to the evil town, let the angels of Adab take him. If he's closer to the city of repentance, let the angels of Rahmah take him. Allah revealed to the land to step aside. Allah wants to accept people when they come to him. The land moved. They measured the distance. They found the distance to the city of Rahma closer. The angels were jubilant that they won someone that came back to Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't despair. Allah is waiting. In another hadith, you know what Allah says? And he tells the Prophet to inform us. He says, oh my servant, if you approach me a pan span, I will approach you an arm span. Or if you come to me walking, I will reciprocate by coming to you running. This is Allah. Don't despair. Another hadith and I'll conclude. The Prophet says, By Allah, I have been told by Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the, maj the majestical, the, the order of the... The Prophet is praising uh, Allah. He said, I have been informed by Allah. That if your people don't sin and repent, I will change him with a group that will come to sin and repent so I could hear them calling Amman Yujibul Mutarra Ida Da'a wa Yakshifusu. This is the God that we want to relate to. Not the God that wants to barbecue people and make them uh, tandoori chicken. God does not have an oven for tandoori chicken. Call Jahannam, brothers and sisters. La Allah. He has the Rahmah which is as vast as the Samawat and the Arabian. The four, the four Khalifa of Islam, are they a reality? They are as real as this cup of water. Of course they are a reality. I mean, they existed, they governed. Why do Shia Muslims not accept this fact? Read charity. What is the actual requirement? Zakat versus Homs. What is the annual calculation? Okay, let's see. Are they a reality? Yes, they are a reality and they govern and they were at the time of Imam Ali and Imam Ali was part of their government and he participated in their government. All right, fine. Are we going to debate the question of the Khilafah after the Prophet on the basis of what happened 
or on the basis of an academic research which is unbiased on the part of both groups in order to find out what did the Prophet want. That's all I want to say. I want to say, let us as Muslims leave our biases aside. Let us bring our proof and debate the question academically, not with the flex of the muscles. No. Let us not debate it who is stronger physically. I can kill you and you can kill me. No. Yes, they came after the Prophet. Yes. But was their rule after the Prophet in the way the Prophet envisaged Imama to be? Let us examine what we have in history and move forward and stop this bloodshed and blood path between us as Muslims because it's not going to get us anywhere. On the contrary, it's going to end our relationship, expand the split between us and our enemies, I will assure you, are sitting day and night laughing at us, at both of us, huh? for what we are doing to one another in that regard. As far as Khums and Zakat is concerned, both school of thought agree that Khums and Zakat are a requirement. Yani our Sunni school of thought does not say that Khums doesn't exist. There is a different interpretation of the question of Khums in regard to its application. Our Sunni brothers say that the application of Khums is only applicable when it comes to the booties of war. You go to a battle, you want those booties from your enemies when it is an imposed war on you. Whatever you get and collect from the spoils of this war, fifth, 20% of these spoils will go towards charity and the sadat of Ahlul Bayt. Even, even among the Sunni school of thought there is. We say no, the question of Khams means You should know that whatever you gain is not restricted to the question of the spoils of war because the word غنمتم is a generic term means anything you earn is subject to 20% tax. When it comes to the question of zakat, our Sunni brother says zakat is on everything that you earn. We said no. Zakat specifically says, according to the Quran, is what is a true when there is the nisab, yani there is the actual percentage of something that has reached. When it flows beyond that particular percentage, you have to pay two and a half percent of it, or whatever the ratio it is. Like in every sheep, 40 sheep, you t give one sheep. In every farming, so it is to do with cattle herds and farming and silver and gold. If you deal with this, does a Shia have to pay khums? Yes, he has to pay khums. And he cannot escape paying khums on these things. So the subtle differences in the interpretation of the law does not make us hate or break each other's back. There is a study that has been made by a very renowned scholar in, of, of the Shias in South Lebanon. His name is Sheikh Muhammad Jawad Mughniya. He wrote a book, say, called it jurisprudence according to the five school of thought where he makes a comparison between the five school of thought Abu Hanifa, Malik, uh, uh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal and uh, 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 Shafi'i and the school of thought of Shia he concluded, what did he conclude? what are the similarities between the five school of thought? Yani, Imam Ja'far Sadiq, if he didn't agree with Abu Hanifa it will agree with Shafi'i if it didn't agree with Shafi'i, it will agree with Malik. If it didn't agree with Malik, it will agree with Ahmad. The school of thought, if they don't agree with one another, they will agree with Imam Jafar as well. What did he find the study to be? 85% to 95% to 90 similarities between the school of thought in their jurisprudential issues. Now, we're going to talk about the major issues of Imam and it. Let if we can agree on 85, it would be ludicrous not to sit and talk. Huh? It does not make sense not to sit and talk then if we have 85% similarities between one another on the question of jurisprudence. How is it possible that 85% to 90% similarities and we are at each other's throat? I don't understand. I really don't understand. What more similarities? Not a single denomination under the sun. Even, you know, the Protestants and the Catholics. The Catholics and the Seventh-day Adventists. The Seventh-day Adventists and the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses and the God knows what uh, Church of England. They don't even have 40% similarities. Not even 40% similarities. Not one single bloodshed among them except in Ireland.
between the Catholic, uh, Catholic and the Protestant, you know? And these people have huge differences and we can't find it in ourselves to sit at the same table, leave our differences and let us talk about these issues so that we can reconcile. Can you clarify again what is fanaticism? I said fanaticism is not not to love your next of kin. I'm finished. <laughs> Uh, is not uh, to love your, sorry, your countrymen. But fanaticism is to prefer your countrymen if they are bad over someone else's countrymen if they are righteous and good. That's fanaticism. According, uh, uh, stop, sorry. Can I leave this for tomorrow? Inshallah. I promise the brothers and sisters who have not had the chance for me to answer the question that tomorrow I will begin in answering their question. Thank you for your attentiveness. Thank you for your support. May Allah bless you. Forgive me if I have يعني, raised my voice. It is not raising a voice at you. It is raising my voice out of concern and out of this deep love and sentiment to my brothers and sisters. Forgive me. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.